Good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming to this Lunch and Learn. Uh, this is going to be a fairly informal Lunch and Learn. Um, today's topic is around social prescribing. The, I work for the Toronto Symphony Orchestra in my role as Director of Education and Community Engagement. We've been grappling with how to better engage with our community. Um, our focus is going to be on three main areas, um, youth music, uh, health and well-being, and uh, connecting with all of Toronto. Um, in terms of the health and well-being aspect of things, I first heard about social prescribing through, um, you may have seen a few newspaper articles about uh, the Royal Ontario Museum's um, large-scale uh, social prescribing program where they are giving away uh, 5,000 uh, admission passes to the ROM this year as part of uh, social prescribing movement. Um, I was also happy to be involved in a um, uh, health and culture group that meets periodically to discuss in initiatives around um, around the intersection between cultural institutions and uh, health and well-being initiatives. Uh, and there I was happy to meet Sonia, uh, who is the uh, social prescribing pilot lead for the Alliance of Healthier Communities in Ontario. They are a voice for community healthcare centers. So it uh, it just so happens that Sonia and the Alliance are uh, hosting their national conference um, for community healthcare centers in Ottawa right now at the same time. So we felt like it was a you know a great opportunity for us to host a session uh, together. Uh, Sonia is a passionate advocate for social prescribing initiatives, and I'm so excited that the TSO has begun experimenting on a small scale with social prescribing, giving away uh, some tickets to our family concerts. And I'm thrilled to welcome her and her colleagues to our conference today to give us a primer on social prescribing, how it might be useful to our organizations, and what that context uh, within uh, the orchestral framework might look like. So, uh, Sonia, welcome. So. This is, this is a more formal room, I think, than we expected. We were hoping for a more informal dialogue as we talk about connectedness and breaking down silos and breaking down barriers. But we will do the best that we can, so I'm going to hang out here. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, we, and I know that you've been probably sitting all day listening to talks, so we were aim to give you a um, high-level overview of the information uh, but also give you a lot of time to discuss and dialogue and make this, um, do a more deep dive on what this actually means to you and uh, if it has any relevance or an impact in your work. Um, so I will, my title probably doesn't mean very much to you, but hopefully by the end of the session, it will. And joining me are my colleagues. Sir Cab is from Riverdale Community Health Center in Toronto, doing very innovative work that you will hear about. Um, and Janice is from Centertown Community Health Center here in Ottawa. So they are both doing, so they, you will hear from them on what this actually looks like on the ground in a sort of front line kind of level. So we'll do, we'll talk about what is health and well-being, we'll talk about what is social prescribing, um, our early results, and some stories, and what's relevant to you. So health. The World Health Organization defines health as the highest attainable state of physical, mental, and social well-being, including the ability to adapt and self-manage in the face of social, physical, and emotional challenges, not merely the absence of disease or infirmities. So that's a mouthful, but captured in this understanding is this view that health is much, much more than access to medical care. There are social and environmental and structural factors that impact people's health and well-being. So that includes um, the structural things like housing and income, but it's also how connected you are to community. Do you feel a sense of belonging? Are you able to contribute? Do you feel a sense of purpose? Are your access to arts and culture um, and to recreation? At the Alliance for Healthier Communities, we represent primary healthcare organizations that um, are committed to this fuller and more holistic understanding of health and well being. So, it, we represent comprehensive primary healthcare organizations across Ontario, including community health centers, that 
ascribe to this model of health and well-being that you see there, this wheel, that takes into more account of the the different social environmental factors that influence people's health is committed and deeply rooted in the community. So it's community led and community governed and also deliver services with interprofessional teams. So we have the traditional clinical complement, so doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners that you're familiar with, but also co-located together with uh, other professionals like social workers and psychologists and health promoters and community developers. And really the focus is on serving people who are um, the most marginalized and vulnerable in our communities, people who face barriers to health and to well-being. Um, and all of our um, community health centers and other members share an electronic medical record system, which is sort of how we keep track of how people are doing, as well as a business tangent system, which enables us to look at our data and, and analyze our data collectively throughout Ontario. So the model of health and well-being is a principle. Like this is the principle on which we operate. But one way to operationalize this, this principle is social prescribing. And very simply put, social prescribing is a way, is a, is a pathway that is intentionally and structure, intentionally structured to connect people from clinical care to social and community supports that may supplement and enhance their well-being. So um, some of you may have heard about social prescribing in the UK. I don't know how many of you are aware of that. A few, I see some nodding. Yeah, so social prescribing, the term has came out of the UK, but it's still fairly young, I think, as, a, as an innovation uh, or as a structured innovation. It's only happening, been happening for over the last couple of years, but it's really taken off. It's now part of the, the I would say, official strategy of the healthcare system in the UK, and they're putting a lot of investments into this. In Ontario, early last year, the Alliance received a one-time grant from the Ministry of Health to implement social prescribing and see what it looks like in our context here in Ontario. So we implemented this in 11 community health centers across Ontario. You'll see the map and their spread. It really is a quite a diversity that represents rural, urban, northern, and francophone communities and allows us to, to look at how it's different and the same across different places. So what actually is social prescribing? It's this term, it's a pathway. Right? It describes this intentional pathway that looks different in different communities because of the assets of the community and also the different needs. But there are main components. So these are the, say the three main components. There is a primary care component. So as a person, a client comes to see their doctors or nurses or other healthcare provider, the provider has an understanding of that wider holistic view of health and is able to recognize when a client comes and actually has underlying issues that can be better supported non-medically. And from the UK research and the research on Ontario, around. 30 to 50% of visits that people make to healthcare providers are non-clinical in nature. And so that's, they can be better supported elsewhere. And so then the, the provider then can refer this person to a link worker. And this is basically a person who is in the middle that is a bridge, who can listen more deeply and be, then be able to connect this person, a client, in a supported way to services and supports and activities, both internally and in the community, that enhances their well-being. Uh, and of course, a huge part of this is the community. You have to have something in the community to connect people to. And so it's building up the community networks and the connections and building the bridges between different siloed sectors um, and inviting people in to co-create solutions. And so it's inviting people in collaboratively to say, you know what is best for you. You have gifts and you have passions to contribute. And what would you like to do? And what can we do together that's gonna benefit not just you, but also a larger community? And you'll hear more, a little bit more about how that works. 
So that's the sort of in a nutshell the pathway. In, in Ontario, in terms of our pilot, a huge part is evaluation. It is trying to look at um, both the contextual factors of how we are different, what works for us may not work for the UK and vice versa. So what is it in our context, what's different? But then also the, the kind of impact that it has on people's lives. So in the medical world, we're very good at data tracking but we're not so good at tracking the social piece of people's health. And so this is looking at the impact on an individual, uh, whether there is impact on their health and their sense of well-being, but it's also on the impact on the healthcare provider, the healthcare system. And increasingly, as we build the partnerships, we're looking at the impact on our partners and on the community as a whole. And this is just, we we're, our pilot started last summer and it ends at the December of this year and so we're sort of midway and we're collecting the interim results right now and I just want to highlight one quote which you might not be able to see because it's very small on the screen this is from one of our francophone communities in Temiskaming and this uh, client says after being laid off I had lost my pride by being involved as a health champion a health champion is one of those people who were invited in to contribute their gifts. By being involved as a health champion, I was helping to fight my isolation while helping people in my community fight their loneliness. I am now proud of myself knowing that I offer others the chance to follow this good prescription, that of putting the life back into our lives. So this is quite transformative for people. And let's actually hear what it looks like on the ground. Uh, Ash, do you, well, maybe I'll start, sorry. <laughs> so I can't bring our, my whole collection of people here, so I have to speak on some of their behalf. In Belleville and Quinty West, they've also invited people in and say, well, what is it that you want to do? And a couple of these people are retired musicians. And so they said, well, we really love music. This is our gift. This is our passion where, you know, we, we have some medical issues, so we come here, but we also want to give back. So they've started a singing group that started off as a structured singing group. So like once a week, come and let's sing together and play instruments together. Nobody showed up after like the first two sessions. So they moved it to the lobby. So a couple, a group of them moved it into their waiting room and said, we're just going to play here. And that's been transformative for them. So people who are coming into the sterile medical environment are now like you come to an environment and it's warm, there's music, there's community. People started sharing their stories with each other and that has so much power in that. And some, um, and people, they, providers are saying like, now that when I see some of these people, they're so much more calm, they're less stressed uh, by the time that I see them because they've had this lovely experience of community while they were waiting. So that's Belleville. West Elgin which is in the southwestern part of Ontario in a rural area outside of London. Zara, not her real name, is a 21-year-old female. And she is high functioning, but on the autism scale. And she has been increasingly isolated since leaving high school. So she just doesn't go out anymore. She stays home all the time. She plays computer all, like plays on her computer all day. And her parents were really concerned. So they went to her primary care provider and said, you know, I don't, don't know what's happening with Zara. Zara is super isolated. And she doesn't look happy what to do with her. And the link worker at West Elgin was able to have these conversations with Zara to say, what are, you in, what are your interests aside from computers? What do you want to do? And it turned out Zara is a trumpet player from high school, but she hasn't had any opportunities to play since school because she just stays at home and I guess it's no fun playing your trumpet at home. But uh, so she's now connected to a local band and she can play trumpet. She's also connected to a local library where she teaches seniors uh, computer skills and now she's out of her house four days a week she's enjoying um, different aspects to her life so that's zara and i will stop talking and we can talk about south riverdale and what's happening in toronto uh so good afternoon my name is sirka perzada and i am the regional manager for chronic disease programs at south riverdale community health center 
South Riverdale Community Health Center is in the downtown East Toronto um, corner of Queen and Carla, for those of you who are familiar with uh, downtown Toronto. And uh, we offer, as uh, Sonia mentioned, uh, interprofessional primary care and holistic health promotion programming to individuals that are marginalized. That's our primary uh, group that we serve as a community health center. Because of our exemplary work in chronic disease management and in harm reduction, the ministry, when they were creating some citywide programs, they reached out to us and said, hey, you guys are doing some really good work. We want you to be in charge of citywide programs as well. And they gave us a program that was a regional program for the city of Toronto. And in it, our job was to provide evidence-based health promotion programs. So a component of uh, the, the matrix of people that deliver services in our health center, one key group for us is people that have lived experience. We call them peer facilitators and they are part of our team as well. So my team is comprised of 74 people that have lived experience and we have trained them in a contingent of core six different health promotion, health education programs. And we've been offering these in partnerships with 36 different organizations in the city of Toronto and operating them out of 47 locations. In doing that work, which is very strict core curriculum based work um, that peers go out into these community settings and provide health education, we kept, uh, we did a research study. Um, and in doing that research study, we found out that that core work was great, but people needed more. After de delivering an evidence-based six week long health education program, what we heard from clients was, well, we still want to come together. And we didn't have the kind of team structure that could allow us to say, yeah, we'll continue to support these groups in these 47 sites across the city. And that's when we started working with the Art Gallery of Ontario. So I should um, sort of uh, specify that we're not part of the social prescribing pilot that the Alliance has led. We were doing this work um, a little two years before this pilot started, partly just out of the needs and, and demands that were driven by the community. And in speaking with Art Gallery of Ontario, we were able to train from our existing 74 peer groups, four individuals in an AGO curriculum that they had tested out with youth ambassadors. They have a program called Peer Youth Ambassador, where individuals that are socially isolated living in community housing come to the AGO for a full day and are led through the gallery by youth ambassadors that are trained first on a gallery tour, then they are provided lunch, and following the lunch, they end up creating artwork. It was a great model, but for a very nimble team. So when I talk about managing 74 people, having 37 partners, uh, my core staff is myself and one other person. So doing that work and serving about 1,200 people in a city in a year, which is what we end up doing, um, we needed to be nimble, but we also needed to come up with a model that wasn't about us anchoring that work. It was more about how do we make this service accessible? So we trained four of our peer facilitators and AGO has been an excellent partner. They gave us full trust and they said, tell us what will work. Is this full day model of us bringing people into AGO, what, what's the model that would work? And we said, not really. We serve marginalized community members, asking people that live with multiple chronic health conditions that might have medical appointments, that might have other pressing needs to take a full day out of their lives and go to the AGO did not make sense to our peers. And the peers were the ones who were trained. They knew that. So they said, no, not really. So that's when they said, why don't we break it up? Why don't we do an AGO tour on a one day? And why don't we do art making on another day? And so we focused first on the AGO tour. What did that look like? So they said, we don't need to do a half a day AGO tour. Why don't we just do a taste of what being in the Art Gallery of Ontario looks like? So we now offer, over the course of, this work began in 2016. By the fall of 2016, we were testing out peer-led mindfulness-focused art gallery visits. So our peers are not art experts. 
it was really about creating facilitated access to what is an overwhelming institution. Uh, if you aren't very aware of what an AGO space looks like and you're living in one of the marginalized communities in the city of Toronto, and all of a sudden somebody tells you, go to the AGO, the chances are you're gonna hesitate. But if, some, if you get a flyer that says, there will be peer facilitators that are gonna take you through the AGO, come experience that visit. And uh, you will get TTC tokens for transportation reimbursement, which is what we as a community health center provide. And our AGO partnership provides a, the access to the community space. Um, we also don't have a link connector because this was bred into the staffing model that we already had. So in, in creating this model for the AGO part of the visit, it's quite simple. It's operational. Monthly, every third Wednesday, we have a 45 minute long peer facilitated visit that became the model after six months of testing and tweaking. We came up with a manual that we now have scaled. We have trained since that first batch of four, nine new peer facilitators. And uh, in, in doing that work, it's seamless. It doesn't even feel like there is something new that we are doing. Um, you can, if you're living in Toronto, you can call our office and say, I wanna sign up for the next um, mindfulness focused visit. Our staff, who is the only other staff, will tell you that, okay, you need to go to the AGO and uh, enter the door and stand to the right. There'll be a person wearing a bright red t-shirt with South Riverdale on, uh, on as a South Riverdale t-shirt, and there'll be a big button that will say, ask me about self-management. You can't miss this person. And that person will be ready. They will know that you're arriving. They'll have the tickets for you. If you need to bring your medical bag with you, we've taken care of that, so then you can bring that with you. They will also have a co-check tickets for you in case you need to do that. And we will start the tour at 11. We never start the tour at 11. We'll always give a grace period. Uh, that's when we'll also give you the tokens. And uh, after the tour, we'll tell you that now that you've been through the space, you can come back here. Wednesday evenings are free for you. Um, and that was first part of the work that we did. The second part that we tackled was the art making. We broke up the visit and we offer art making at our Danforth and Greenwood location on a monthly basis. And we were very intentional. We only offer that to people that have taken our core programs. We didn't, we wanted to be very intentional about that because we needed somebody to have an understanding of what a class structure looks like to come back and commit to that type of work. And, um, our peers had learned eight to nine different art making activities. But then again, with the co-design part, they said, we don't think we can do all of these. These are not scalable. If you ever wanna take this model out beyond our Danforth and Greenwood location, we need to be able to do something that's accessible and we can go from our location to your location, for example. So we ended up choosing two uh, artwork and some of our biases, as I call them, positive biases, factored into that learning. We have a Christy Belcour interpretation of uh, artwork. If you're familiar with Christy Belcour, who's an indigenous artist who does a lot of beadwork, um, a table much like this, there would be a Christy Belcour piece of artwork behind us. There's music going and people with Q-tips paint around and uh, create an artwork interpretation of themselves of, of what they think is the art that Christie's presenting. And it's a, an icebreaker. And the next piece is an Emily Carr um, artwork that they get to take home, a five by eight canvas on which they cut pictures out of magazine, color, paint, paste, and they get to take it home. That work also has been operating and then we offer them on a monthly basis at our Danforth and Greenwood um, location. And because of that work, now we are branching into a partnership with Toronto International Film Festival that we will launch later this year. And the idea again is to take TIFF out of TIFF and into the community. Um, it's in the co-design phase and uh, I'll have a better idea of what this model looks like by September. But again, it will be um, film discussions led by peer facilitators, not by TIFF staff. And TIFF is uh, much like the AGO, a really excellent partner in this. So if you're thinking about for all of you in your various institutions, how you could potentially look at health and well-being impact of arts and cultural institutions, there are ways in which you could build capacity in others 
and or partner with organizations that have capacity. Uh, Sonia has mentioned already that, you know, there are many of our clients have talents. So how do you capitalize on that and how do you build up on that? That would allow you to nurture them, but also connect with them in a way that hasn't been intentional. It's that structured connection. And you don't necessarily always need a pathway to build those connections because we think that you're all community assets. And how do we build those bridges is going to be the fun part of figuring this out. I think that that's what I wanted to say. Okay. Do you want to speak to other partnerships? And I think that's what's on this slide is just some of the other partnerships um, with Royal Ontario Museum, which you would have heard about with their big social prescribing program. And as Aaron has said, the Toronto Symphony Orchestra, um, and also with the environment sector with Equal Health Ontario. Um, but I think what Sir Cap has mentioned is a really good example of how to go beyond admissions. So it's access is one thing, but it, a supported and facilitated access is really the next step on that. Um, and maybe Janice, you want to share sure. how things are going at Centertown? So we're actually not far from where I work, uh, Centertown Community Health Center, which is at the corner of Bank and Cooper, very close. And we've been participating in the social prescribing pilot um, led by the Alliance. Uh, and I won't get into the nitty gritty about our own internal work that's been happening as a result of the pilot in terms of referral pathways and, and client journeys and our electronic medical records. Um, but I just wanted to mention a few stories that I thought were relevant for um, folks who are musicians or art artistic community types. Um, so one thing that's just happened in the past month is we have a, a very active LGBTQ newcomer group. So these are folks coming, um, seeking asylum in Canada and who come with a ton of um, stories and uh, like very real lived experiences of loss and um, a, a ton of resilience as a result. And so um, an artist was invited um, by uh, the, one of the facilitators of the group to come in and develop a piece of visual art with the participants of the group. And through the process of um, kind of telling stories together as a group and um, um, then being invited to reflect on those stories and to then, um, she's a visual artist that works with, at, well, worked with, um, I can't remember, it's like a thick clear plastic. And so everyone had their own little like honeycomb and they kind of reflected and did this storytelling process and then kind of drew on their own little honeycomb. And then they were all linked together and hung up and then, um, there was a presentation for the community where uh, the artist and then the, the, the group members talked about the art that they made and the importance of, of, of coming together to, to share these stories. And so for me, this is kind of just one example of how um, that those partnerships of having, you know, artists come to where folks are that don't have access to um, the music or the art or, or whose access is really limited or maybe by chance or maybe by a free pass. Um, those are all lovely things. And what happens when um, the art can be really shaped by the lived experience of folks and created together is something that I think is really interesting. Um, and uh, mutually energizing because I think the artist at the end had this beautiful piece of visual art that they collectively created and that was healing for everyone to, to make together. So um, things like that. There's also um, a theater group that will often um, come into the center once a year and with folks who have lived experience with the mental health system make a, a, a it's called a um, forum theater of, uh, you know, their own lived experience with living with stigma and present it to the center. And so things like that are really, uh, 
add a ton of depth and richness to what we can, you know, provide space for, but don't have the, um, you know, that's not our, that's not really in our toolbox, you know? So like having those connections and um, making those things together can be uh, just add a, a whole other depth of experience and healing, I think, and empowerment for folks who are already gathered um, at, at the center. Um, a little social prescribing related thing was we also have been experimenting a little bit with health champions and um, inviting people to kind of share some of their gifts. Um, and so there's like a fledgling uh, talent optional musical gathering that's been happening where people, um, there's a few staff who like one who plays ukulele and one who plays guitar. And so they'll kind of invite people to come. And even if you just want to tap your foot, you know, to come and, and just people love it. And uh, it's, it's um, lovely to see. Um, but because there's, you know, staff are busy and they're not, it's not in their job description to pay, play ukulele. There's, it, it's one of those things that, hmm, this could be a nice partnership, you know, like these kinds of gatherings that are already have some energy and momentum, but then just can use some support. Um, and uh, there's also been a health champion who loves movies. And so he's like, I wanted to, I want to have a film night. So he's been showing these films and people come together and chat about them. And um, it's so bringing, I feel like bringing the arts a little bit more into our sector has been, um, uh, it's just positive. And uh, I feel like there's a ton of opportunity and uh, it's just exciting to think about how that flow can kind of go back and forth in terms of um, what you can collaborate on. So, uh, yeah, I thought I'd just give those concrete examples. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Janice. Um, yeah, I think when we started social prescribing, we were not expecting this to be like an arts thing. We were thinking connecting people, connecting people who are isolated, creating connections and, and belonging and all those things. But your colleagues in the arts and culture sector really took up the mantle on this and and saw the possibilities. And as you've heard, like many of um, centers in their existing work have seen the, I would say the tremendous power of the arts on people's health and like their mental health, their need to create um, and the sense of healing uh, and camaraderie, if I can say that, and the community that comes with that. Um, lest you think that this is only happening in Ontario, this is, momentum is not just in the UK, it's going across the board in Canada. So the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts has this interesting partnership that they've been doing last year, the year before, uh, with a small group of physicians on the impact of visual art, I guess, museums, visiting museums on people's health. And their study has come out and they have found um, really quite an impact on people's sense of well-being. In British Columbia, we, the Ministry of Health through the United Way has or is beginning to pilot social prescribing schemes for seniors. Uh, in Alberta, there's this prescription to get active that has to do with physical activities. But in PEI, in their most recent election, uh, social prescribing made it onto the Green Party's election platform. And we've heard from others from around um, the country that are really interested. And so there is lots of momentum behind this. So what does this have to do with you um, as people in orchestras? It's an opportunity for you to increase your reach, increase the reach of your music and your art to people who may traditionally not have access due to various barriers, um, or even are just new to the country and don't know that you exist. Um, it's, a, it's an opportunity to collaborate on measuring impact and that, uh, on, on measuring things that we maybe traditionally don't have, haven't done. It's an opportunity for non-traditional partnerships and funding opportunities um, we are increasingly moving towards, certainly in Ontario, the sense of 
building the connections and building the bridges and um, needing to be more integrated. Um, and so that's uh, an opportunity as well. Being a part of a movement that is beyond you know, your physical location, wherever you are geographically, but this is a movement that's happening in Ontario, but also across Canada. And uh, how many of you are going to the session afterwards that Ian will be in around, um, was it inclusion and art? Okay, okay, love you. If you're not planning to go, you should definitely go to that one. <laughs> but if I can, I had the opportunity to meet with Ian and Claire uh, before this, and if I can steal some of what Ian has said, um, who is from your world of music, is that this makes music better. It is, it makes it fuller and broader. So it's not just um, art for health, but it is art and well-being. And, and it's, a, it's a kind of collaboration that can be enriching on both sides. And so you, for more, you'll have to hear Yin. That was my, my promo spiel. <laughs> and just a couple considerations when you're thinking about this, when this is percolating through your minds, um, keeping in, t in mind the equity lens. And this is, this is where I think with Sirkab and Janice have, have talked about. Um, it's, there, are, there are many people who would benefit well um, from music and the arts, uh, but have barriers. And so it's, what can we do to reduce those barriers? And what can we do to facilitate access um, as a sense of justice, right? Like that music should be equitable for people and health should be equitable. Uh, being open for the non-traditional initiatives that you have heard great examples of here. Um, being realistic of your capacities, but also ours in the community health setting. Uh, and reducing administrative burdens for everybody.